Ego syntonic means anything that feels a-okay to us. And anything that is ego dystonic, it's the opposite. It feels like this is not me. The ego often has to change. The things that are most deeply authentic to us can feel alien to the ego. And the things that keep us isolated and trapped and in suffering feels like an average day and we even kind of like some of those things. These are some psychobabble terms that I don't have a good replacement for. Mm -hmm. So if I did, I'd just use those. But these, these, you know, these are kind of wonderful terms in a way because they, they give us language for this very specific, important thing. And I, like I said, I don't have a, another way of talking about them in, in great specificity without using these terms. So ego syntonic means anything that feels a-okay to us. It feels like it is uh, in harmony with how we think about ourselves. And anything that is ego dystonic feels it's the opposite. It feels like this is not me. This is not right. This is not who I am. This is not something I should be embracing. So if you think about it, pretty much everything in your life, including Certain attitudes are either ego syntonic or ego dystonic. So perhaps an, uh, you know, an oversimplification, but I think that broad concepts like this can be really helpful and really help us penetrate uh, what's actually going on. And in particular, like you said, Joseph, what goes on in analysis? I think old psychotherapy has as its goal to put us in right order towards the things that are life-affirming. As Jungians, we take that a little bit deeper step, which is not just life-affirming, but actually are aligned with the deepest and most authentic aspect of oneself. Mm -hmm. And that the ego often has to change. That right. The things that are most deeply authentic to us can feel alien to the ego. So it's, it's a complicated thing that the things that are good for us and authentic can seem alien, and the things that keep us isolated and trapped and in suffering feel like a standard fare. Mm -hmm. feels like an average day, and, and we even kind of like some of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and this goes into or one way of thinking about it has to do with the individual's self-perception values and identity. So thoughts, behaviors, feelings, which are in harmony with my self-perception, my values and identity, feel natural and, and very much acceptable. I think that's a really common, um, important element because we really find it, particularly in the public discourse, this is unacceptable. This is acceptable. And then we hear that binary, God knows it's um, such a big part of the collective and all of this kind of social control that's uh, rising up in our political system. Mm -hmm. But for instance, like if a person takes pride in their work ethic and their responsibility, they might see their perfectionism as a very positive trait mm -hmm. um, because it lines up with a central sense of themselves and their value system. Now, ego dystonic stuff, again, thoughts, behaviors, and feelings, but they're in conflict with self perception, values, and identity, make people feel uncomfortable. This seems unacceptable. So, for instance, a person with obsessive compulsive disorder might recognize that their compulsive behaviors are irrational and, right. and excessive, but they still feel forced to engage in them, and it feels incredibly upsetting to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's ego dystonic. This is not how I think of myself. Right, or this is not how I want to be. This mm -hmm. is, yeah, this is at odds with the way I want to, with the way I want to be in the world. Um, I, you know, to frame it up, although I imagine I'll want to come back here after we've talked about it more, you were, you were talking about our specific 
take on this as Jungians, and it is, I think, a broadly psychoanalytic idea. But to, to flesh that out a little bit more, I think it has to do with being in right relationship with the self, let's say, or the unconscious. So this idea has underlying it the notion of the ego self axis, that our ego can be appropriately aligned with the, the values and goals that emanate from the center of the personality that Jung called the self, or we can be out of whack. And when we're out of whack, one way or the other, either because we're rejecting something we should be embracing, or we're embracing something we should be rejecting, symptoms develop, we may feel stuck, we may feel depressed, we may feel anxious, we may feel a kind of inner conflict, we may have dreams that rattle us a little bit. Because in some sense, the unconscious or the self, whichever, uh, you know, in, in, in some sense, they're roughly equivalent, is saying, excuse me, you've got the wrong attitude. So Jung talked a lot about um, finding a new attitude. And I think this is a part of that. I don't think it's quite the same thing. I think the, the, the idea of the new attitude is actually a much broader, deeper concept. But this might be part of it. Like, oh, I've always thought it was really wrong to, uh, you know, to let my anger bubble up. I always just assumed that that was wrong. That was something I shouldn't do. Uh, or, or maybe even more specifically, I always thought it was wrong to complain about my mother. And then the person comes into analysis and it's like, well, this is a space where we can talk about anything. So tell me, what would you like to say about your mother? So this thing that was very ego-dystonic, which was to criticize the mother, becomes allowed, becomes uh, maybe not fully embraced, but it's no longer off limits. So we might imagine the ego is identified with being nice. Right. And then anything that doesn't seem nice seems out of character. For us. And then, as you said, we then rear away or we make all these kind of rules. And it doesn't seem nice to be critical about anyone, but particularly perhaps one's mother, who might, we might really need to tell ourselves the truth about right. some pretty egregious behavior that was very confusing to us. And so, one of the ways we'll, the weird things we'll do is in order to be nice and try to minimize the internal conflict will then misconstrue some of the damaging behavior from the mom as acceptable or even laudable so that we trick ourselves into thinking, well, it must have been fine for thus and such to be done. So to get in touch with the more authentic sense, which was what you were saying, Lisa, which is this fire inside of us that's trying to protect our integrity. Mm -hmm. So... Being able to read those signals coming from the deep unconscious and to make adjustments in our ego attitude, oh, I need to align more with this thing that used to be off limits or, you know, this thing that I used to think was really great, maybe it's not so great. That There's a kind of flexibility in an ego that can do that, that tends to make us more adapted to the outer world, more easily adapted to the outer world, I would say. And to uh, facilitate psychospiritual growth. I think there's, um, we're naturally sorting into two categories, I think, which is very important. Is that sometimes we might just be in therapy and, we, and somebody says, listen, I, um, I, I'm overeating. You know, I've put on 50 pounds. Um, this is unacceptable. I, I don't like it. I don't like to see myself this way. I, I, when, I, when I think of myself, I don't even see myself as being overweight, but then I look in a right. mirror and it's right. shocking to me. And so the therapist then examines what's going on in terms of, let's just say it's not a medical problem, but literally the kinds of food one's eating, when one is eating, the volume one is eating, et cetera, et cetera. There's something about the things one eats, volumes and time, that seem acceptable. Somehow it seems like I'm that kind of a person. You know, I've always wanted uh, 
a midnight snack of a half right. a gallon of ice cream. I, I, I started in college. I had, a, you know, one or two pints of Hagen dazs You know, it was fantastic mm-hmm. before I went to bed. That's me. And so it's difficult for the ego on a feeling level to be able to feel that some of the things that are causing this health problem actually should feel bad because the result is, is really bad for you. But something inside of us isn't saying that at all. And then on a much deeper level, which analysis is more concerned with, is that what the self is encouraging us to take on should feel good. But initially it is so alien to us that it feels scary or unacceptable, but it won't let us go. It's that kind of road to Damascus where Paul keeps, you know, mm-hmm. he's hearing this voice, this pressure, and, you know, and he's actually going after Jesus. He's going to really got to take him down. And, and, and then all of a sudden, this intervention of self, and Paul's like, oh my gosh, I, I have, right. I, I need a 180 degree or feels a 180 degree term. It's not so much that the ego decides it, but feels that attitude towards this thing that was negative is suddenly its opposite. 